All right, so this is Math 466, Advanced Applied Analysis, Lecture 13. It is not Mountain Day, so some of us are sadly still here. Uh, what I want to do is I want to do just a little bit of material to set the stage for next Wednesday's lecture when we will see applications of Fourier analysis to proving Kronecker's theorem. So the big theorem that we had is if alpha is irrational, then n alpha mod 1 is equidistributed. And so what that means is that you know, the limit as n goes to infinity, the number of n such that n alpha mod 1 is in AB, which is contained in 0, 1, and n is at most n, if we divide that by n, that it equals b minus a. So it says that in the limit, the amount of time you find yourself in the segment is just the length of that segment. So, yes. Okay? More is true. If you know things about the algebraic structure of alpha, how well alpha can be approximated by rationals, you can actually get convergence rates. So not just you know, in the limit it will be b minus a, it's how quickly do you approach this. So in probability, you know, what's the big result in probability? Biggest result of the subject. Big theorem in probability. Only one natural candidate. Central limit theorem, right? You know, when you see words like central, fundamental, this is a flag that it really matters. So the th central limit theorem, which is phenomenal, is if your independent, identically distributed random variables are nice, then they converge to being normally distributed. How quickly? It turns out how quickly there's a beautiful theory called the berry essen theorem, which talks about the rate of convergence. And it's related to the higher moments. In particular, it's related to the third moment. What's really going on is if I give you a probability distribution, if it's nice, I can shift it so it has mean 0. I can then rescale so it has variance 1. So really, if I give you a nice probability distribution, the first two moments don't really tell you any information. It's the third moment that starts giving you some idea of how the distribution actually looks. And that controls the rates of convergence. So here, this is the result we want to prove. And we're going to prove this using Fourier analysis. In particular, we will use Fayer's theorem. And so we're going to see why we spent all this time in the beginning of the semester doing Fourier analysis. It's a great subject, but we wanted to get to Benford's Law. We wanted to talk about you know, when certain systems are Benford. And this is a great way, if you're n alpha mod 1, and we saw for Fibonacci's, this works. For geometric processes, it's essentially the same thing. If you want, you can look at the Fibonacci's as almost a geometric process, where you're increasing by 1 plus root 5 over 2 every year. You know, if you do like the stock market, you're not going to have an increase of 66% you know, a year. You, you probably have, if you're lucky, somewhere between maybe 2 and 12%. And then you can look at over time, how does this travel? Well, if you're always going up by, say, 3%, you'll spend a lot more time going from 1 to 2 than you will from 9 to 10. And so you can do the calculation. Jay did this in his talk. And you'll see that geometric processes are benefit. And it all comes down to showing this result. So we want to prove this. We will prove this carefully on Wednesday. Before we prove this, sometimes it's fun to ask weaker results. So this is telling us that you give me any interval a, b, the amount of times I fall into it is in the limit, the fraction is b minus a, or b minus a n over n. What about an easier question? Do I land in the interval once? Or related to that, do I get close to every point? You know, we're saying it's equidistributed. So if it's equidistributed, then that means eventually I should get close to any point. And so this leads to an easier question called denseness. We say a sequence xn is dense 
in 0, 1 if given any alpha in 0, 1 for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists an n such that alpha minus xn is less than epsilon. So density search means you get arbitrarily close infinitely often to whatever you want. Because I can choose my epsilons to be a sequence of numbers getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So the first question is, do we think n alpha mod 1 is dense? If alpha is irrational. It better be since we're showing it's equidistributed. What you could do for your interval, you know, AB is, you know, here's alpha, and you may be alpha plus epsilon over 2, alpha minus epsilon over 2. You know, there's an interval about alpha. Because we're dense, I'm sorry, because we're uniformly distributed, we have to lie in this interval. Therefore, we'll be within epsilon over 2 of alpha. So, Uniformly distributed clearly implies denseness, but it's possible to be dense without being uniformly distributed. For example, consider x n equals um, n mod 5 over n. If n, if you're uniformly distributed, you're clearly dense. Because if you're uniformly distributed, you're arbitrarily close. Let's do it this way. So let's let xn be, you know, k mod 5 over 5 when n is even, and then if it's odd, um, n minus 1 over 2 square root of 5 if n is odd, uh, mod 1. So this will give me a sequence in 0, 1. n minus 1 over 2, well, if n is odd, Think of n as 2k plus 1, so this becomes 2k, so this becomes k, so this is k root 5. So this is uniformly distributed. But this one is going to have spikes at 0, 1 fifth, 2 fifths, 3 fifths, 4 fifths. So this resulting sequence is going to be dense, because this is uniformly distributed, but it's not going to be uniformly distributed. I have half of my mass at 0, 1 fifth, 2 fifths, 3 fifths, 4 fifths. And you can play lots of games like this. So we will try to show first that if alpha is irrational, then n alpha is dense. And then we'll actually do this by proving a little bit more. We'll talk about how well we can approximate alpha. And we'll start to see how algebraic structure plays a role in a lot of these problems. So So Dirichlet has a lot of theorems, okay? So the following. Um, if alpha is irrational, then there exist infinitely many relatively prime p and q such that alpha minus p over q is less than 1 over q squared. Hurwitz improved this I believe to 1 over square root of 5 q squared. I'm not sure so I'll put less than or equal to just to cover myself. You can't do better than this for all numbers. There's one number that unfortunately can't do better than this. Golden mean. So we actually need this, I believe, for the golden mean. 
But if you think about this, if I want to get pi to 10 digits, that's not that bad. Look at a denominator like 10 to the 10. But it's expensive because I'm using a 10 digit number. What this is telling me is the denominator is basically the square root over here. So that's phenomenal. That's incredible savings. Now it turns out that there are some numbers that you can approximate even better than this. And these numbers have some very interesting properties. It turns out if a number can be extremely well approximated, it has to be transcendental. It can't be the root of a finite polynomial. It's a strange result. If people are interested, it's actually not that hard to prove. Um, so maybe we'll prove that later. So let's 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 prove Dirichlet's theorem. Right. Has everybody seen the pigeonhole principle? So if you take your gun and you put in n plus one pigeons, and you have n boxes and you shoot the pigeons so that the pigeons have to go into boxes, right? And you've shot n plus one pigeons into n boxes. If all the boxes had one or fewer pigeons, then it only accounts for n pigeons and you shot n plus one pigeons. So at least one box gets two. It's possible that one box has two and everything else has one. It's possible that all the pigeons go in one box. It's possible that some pigeons were harmed in the experiment. That's fine. You know, we're not assuming that this is a easy process for the pigeons. It turns out this is one of the most useful observations in mathematics. It's called the pigeonhole principle, or the box principle, or Dirichlet's box principle. So let's look at it over here. Let's look at xn is n alpha. And so if we look, let's fix some large integer q. And let's look at x1, x2, xq, and xq plus 1. And we can look at all of these mod 1. So here's 0, here's 1 over q, 2 over q, 3 over q, and 1. How many boxes do we have? So how many boxes do I have? I have two boxes. So a, a generic box would be, you know, k over q to k plus 1 over q. How many pigeons do we have? q plus 1 pigeons. x1, x2, x q plus 1 mod 1. So what do we know? The two of them have to be in the same box. Do we know which box? No. Do we know which pigeons? No. But we know that maybe x i, well, it's, uh, I want to think which letters I want to use. Um, x m minus x n minus some integer, right? Is going to be less than one over q, or maybe less than equal to one over q. Because they're in the same box, well, because it's we're looking at the mod one, so it's x n mod one minus x n mod one has to be at most one over q. So there's some integer. We don't know what that integer is. We can call it call it i minus some integer. So what does this mean? This means m alpha minus n alpha minus i is less than equal to 1 over q. Or alpha minus i divided by m minus n is less than equal to 1 over 
m minus n times q. Is it possible that m minus n equals 0? No, you'd have the same pigeon. What's the smallest m minus n could be? One. What's the largest it could be? Q. So big Q here is going to be at least as large as m minus n. It could be larger. So this whole thing has to be less than or equal to 1 over m minus n squared. So now all you do is you take p equals i and q equals m minus n, and you'll get alpha minus p over q is less than or equal to 1 over q squared. But Dirichlet said it was strictly less than, and I got less than or equal to. Right? We're close. Any thoughts as to how to get rid of the equal sign? You know, right now we have, unfortunately, it's less than or equal to. I want to get rid of the equal sign. What would it mean if it was equal? So if I had an equal sign here, what would that mean? I'd have absolute value of alpha minus p over q equals 1 over q squared. What would that imply? So if equal, then I would have alpha equals p over q plus or minus 1 over q squared. Why can't that happen? What would it mean if that happens? What, what are we assuming about alpha? We're assuming alpha is irrational. And this would be rational. So because that's rational, we can now just erase the equal sign there. You know, This is the smallest improvement you can have in mathematics, to go from a less than or equal to to a less than. Um, oh, let's see. OK. Oh, good point, yes. Um, you're right, okay, so we did not use relatively prime. Um, You're right. Okay, so you're right. So we've just shown that there are infinitely many p and q, such as this is true. So you're right. So we did not do relatively prime. So p and q could have a common factor. And let's think about how bad that could be. If they have a common factor, it's actually better for us. Imagine 10 divides p and q. So we could then replace this with something smaller. So we can now restore. Well, we've got to be careful. So let's say p equals um, 10 p prime, q equals 10 q prime. And then we have alpha minus p over q is less than 1 over q squared. So we'd get alpha minus p prime over q prime is less than 1 over 100, 1 over q prime squared. 
So this is even better than what we wanted. So if they weren't relatively prime, it gives us a better result. We're almost done this one subtle thing which people often ignore in this. So I like how we first got rid of the equal sign, then we got rid of the fact, well, if they're not relatively prime, we can at least fix that. There's one danger. What if we keep generating the same DMP over Q every single time? Right? I'm claiming that there are infinitely many. Maybe we keep getting the same one again and again and again. The reason we can uh, eliminate that case is if we come over here, notice that this was less than or equal to 1 over Q. So our approximation, it's less than or equal to 1 over um, m minus n Q. If I'm using the same approximation again and again and again, I'll keep the big Q here. I know my approximation has to be better than 1 over Q because m minus n is at least 1. That would make this denominator as small as possible. So when we get up here, we get alpha minus P over Q is less than equal to 1 over Q. So we just have to denote note that. Note alpha minus P over Q is less than 1 over Q. So we can't get the same pair again and again and again every single time. Because if we did, there's a finite difference between alpha and P over Q. Choose big Q so large that now 1 over Q is less than that. And then you force yourself to get a new P over Q. So this will generate infinitely many P's and Q's. Sure. So we have the following is true. And this is because m minus n is greater than or equal to 1. So imagine we kept getting the same p of p over q again and again and again, or we just got one of finitely many p over q. If we're only getting finitely many p and q, then this alpha minus p over q, it's going to take on a minimum value. Choose q so large that 1 over q is less than that minimum value then that pair P over Q can't work. So if only finitely many P over Q generated, let P star over Q star be closest, choose Q such that 1 over Q is less than alpha minus p star over q star. And that finishes the proof. So there's a lot of nice stuff going on here about how you have to be careful or proving one case. And then once you've proven that, can you refine it? Can you tweak it? Can you push it? We got rid of the equal sign. We didn't originally have relatively prime, but then we realized if they're not relatively prime, the result is even better. So we might as well assume they're relatively prime. And then the only last problem was maybe the pair P over Q, maybe we kept getting the same pair again and again and again. It just tells us some pair exists. Well, if we kept getting the same pair again and again and again, we would have a problem because we can keep changing the big Q. And we can choose big Q so large that we know this has to be less than 1 over big Q. If only finally many pairs were generated, it's not going to work. All right, so what this tells us is we could approximate any irrational very well with rationals. Okay, any questions on the proof? All right, let's now use this to show that it's dense. So claim alpha irrational and alpha mod 1 is dense. So what does that mean? Yes? Is there, no there is no real, I mean, you can do uh, ra um, reals minus the rationals, but we don't have a symbol really for the irrationals. Because instead of introducing a symbol for the irrationals, we can just use the not element of. 
So consider you know, the sequence P n over Q n from Dirichlet. So we know alpha minus P n over Q n is less than 1 over Q n squared. All right, well, that means Q n alpha minus P n is less than 1 over Q n. And this sequence goes to infinity. So this is less than epsilon if n is sufficiently large. You give me any epsilon, and we can choose n so large that this is true. Um, n goes to infinity. You know, for each n, we get an approximation p n q n, such that alpha minus p n over q n is at most one over q n squared. And so, just multiply through by q n, we'll get q n alpha minus p n is less than one over q n. And I can make that less than epsilon for any given epsilon. So, what do you know about q n alpha? Where does q n alpha mod one have to live? I'm sorry? Within zero. Within zero. But be more specific. Yeah. Here's zero. Here's one. Where do you think Q and alpha is? Well, where? It's got to be somewhere in zero, one. Do you think it's near a half? Do you think it's near three fourths? Where do you think it's near? <coughs> What does this t equation tell you? P, I'm sorry, Q n alpha minus P n is less than one over Q n is less than epsilon. So where must it live? It's like um, P n away from epsilon. Well, P n is an integer. All right. So we, I, I want to study Q n alpha mod one. Where does that live? Will it live in an epsilon neighborhood of 1 over qn? Not of 1 over qn. You're close. What is the point pn mod 1? What kind of number is pn? It's an integer. So what is Pn mod 1? It's 0. So this tells me my distance from 0, when I look at you know, Qn alpha mod 1, is at most epsilon. So where must Qn alpha mod 1 live? Between 0 and epsilon. Or, so one possibility is it could be between 0 and epsilon. Where else could it live? Oh. Or it could live down here, at one between 1 minus epsilon. So you have two cases. This is case one. Your Q and alpha mod one lives in here. And this would be case two. The two cases are handled very similarly. We want to show it's dense. You give me some number here, say x. What I know is I know Q1 alpha mod 1, in case 1, I'm somewhere through here. If I look at 2 Q and alpha mod 1, I move at most how much? And the length of the box is? Um, I think you could do that. I would say you move at most epsilon. You know, if we go from Q and alpha mod 1 to 2 Q and alpha mod 1, we move at most epsilon. Then if we go to 3 Q and alpha minus mod 1, we move at most epsilon. 4 Q, oh, I've got to be careful saying that. Uh, if we do the next one, it would be at most another epsilon. So every time we move, we move by at most epsilon. So I know somewhere between X minus epsilon and X plus epsilon, because every step is at most epsilon. 
I can't hop from x minus epsilon to beyond x plus epsilon. So what we do is we study qn alpha, 2qn alpha, 3qn alpha, dot, 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 dot. And one of these will come in here. Everybody comfortable with this proof? What if we're in case two? Well, in case two, all that changes is we just walk in the other direction. Because now, qn alpha mod 1 is a small negative number. So every time we add it, we move leftward a little bit. And so this proves denseness. So it is possible to prove denseness elementarily. We are not using any big results in Fourier analysis. In some sense, there is no need to do this, because once we prove it's uniformly distributed, we know it's dense. But there will be other situations where we may not be able to show something is uniformly distributed. It also it gives us a nice result about how well can you approximate a irrational with rationals. All right. You can approximate it pretty well. And then I'll just state Liouville's theorem. Um, and then I think that'll be a good place to end. So we'll have Dirichlet's theorem over here. We have Hurwitz's improvement. Oh. Yeah, I mean, if, if I had to guess, I would say definitely within 70 years. I mean, a lot of this comes from you know, using continued fractions. And in some sense, you know, it's nice to get that extra root 5, but what really matters is the dependence on Q. So we have the following thing by Leoville. So we say F is approximable by rationals to order n if there are infinitely many solutions to alpha minus p over q is less than 1 over q to the n. And n doesn't necessarily have to be an integer here. OK. A polynomial with integer coefficients of degree d, f, has roots alpha of order at most d. So if you are a polynomial with integer coefficients and you're a root of that polynomial, I can't approximate you better than 1 over q to the d. OK? So if you're po if you're no, no, a polynomial with integer coefficients of degree d. So for instance, you know, f of x is, you know, a d x to the d plus a zero. And f of alpha equals zero. I, yeah, I yep, totally that. that's fine. So if I have a situation like this, I can't approximate alpha better than 1 over q to the d infinitely often. I might be able to do it a couple of times, but I can't do it infinitely often. So a number is algebraic if it is a root of a polynomial with integer coefficients of finite degree. If it's not algebraic, it's transcendental. It, is, it was hard for a long time to show certain numbers are transcendental. Almost every number is transcendental. It's hard to find you know, algebraic numbers if you choose a number at random. We have ways to show numbers like pi and e are transcendental. 
and the proofs are locally easy. It's just a lot of integration in algebra and you can follow it line by line by line. It may not be clear why you're doing all this, but at the end of the day, you get pi as transcendental, you get e as transcendental. If I can find a number that can be extremely well approximated by rationals, what must be true? Well, algebraic means I can't approximate it better than 1 over q to the d. So what if I could approximate it to 1 over q infinitely often, 1 over q squared infinitely often, 1 over q cubed infinitely often? What must it be? It must be transcendental. So one way to construct a transcendental number after you prove Liouville's theorem is you just have to find a number that is extremely well approximable by rationals. And I'll give you two Liouville numbers. Transcendentals. The first one is the sum and goes from 1 to infinity of 10 to the negative n factorial. Boy, do you have deserts. You know, this is 1 tenth plus 1 hundredth plus 1 millionth. What comes next? 1 over 10 to the 24. I'm not going to write down the zeros anymore. The next one is 1 over 10 to the 120. If you want to approximate this by rationals, just chop it off over here. And your error is essentially 1 over 10 to the 120. Well, if I multiply this by 5, so this looks like I'm approximating it to order 1 over q to the fifth. If I chop it off over here, it'll look like I'm approximating it to 1 over q to the sixth. So you know, the calculation is in the book. We might do this later in the semester if you're interested, proving that this is transcendental. The continued fraction version of it is just you know, 0, um, 10, 100, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 24, 10 to the 120. Just do it as a continued fraction. If you want infinitely many, Ten to the negative So you give me any number, let B n of alpha be its nth binary digit. So this is nth binary digit. So when we're looking at the binary expansion of alpha, which is in zero one. It's nth digit is either going to be a 0 or 1, so all these numbers here are either 1 or 2. And with a little bit of work, you can show that all these will be transcendental. You've got to be a little bit careful because there are some numbers that have two binary expansions. So you just have to make up a rule as to what you're going to do if you have two binary expansions. Choose either the one that terminates or choose the one that doesn't, but just have some well-defined rule as to what you will do. And this will give you uncountably many transcendental numbers. So there's a lot of interesting stuff here. These numbers have strange properties. And because they are so well approximable by rationals, some things will go wrong and you will have, I think, things uh, being very slow in which, and I think, how quickly equidistribution sets in. Because if you look at one, you know, if you took alpha to be one fifth, if you look at n alpha mod one, you get zero, one fifth, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths, zero, one fifth, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths, zero, right? So if you look at, you know, n times one fifth mod one, it's it's not going to be uniform. This is an irrational number. It will be uniform, but it's so well approximable by some rationals, that it might take a little bit more time before things set in. 
And so in one of my papers on Bedford, I needed to prove that something had a finite um, approximable exponent. And I think I, you know, I just needed something that was finite, so I did the worst argument possible. And I think I got it was at most 10 to the 602. It's the largest finite number I've used in any of my papers. You know, it, I needed something less than infinity. And then the rapidity in which things set in is one over that number. So the smaller you are, the more irrational you are in some sense, and the faster things set in. So 1 over 10 to the 602 is bad. All right, so this is a good place to start. Well, it, it just means it's going to take a lot longer for things to set in. It's going to look like irrational for longer periods of time. Like a rational or like Oh, like a rational. So I, I apologize. I have a Boston accent, plus I am completely congested. It is not a good combination. Um, but so anyways, this is preliminaries for Wednesday. Wednesday, we're going to use Fayette's theorem to prove and this is from, I think, like section 12.3, that n alpha mod 1 is equidistributed if alpha is irrational. So this is a major result. This is one of the big things we need to prove Benford behavior. So it's nice to know that we spent all this time doing Fourier analysis for a reason. All right.